Hello, Kristen. Hi, Abe. Let me just give everyone a backstory. I just literally saw a post on Twitter that someone had taken one of Kristen's posts for Independence Day, and it was so compelling. And I just was like, wow. And I just followed her into TikTok, which happily enough, she was following me. So this happened within the past half hour. So I direct message her. Fortunately, she was online. And here we are, because I think what Kristen has to say is really important. And I want to make sure that her message for the few things that she speaks of are you know, brought to the people who I have come to know as my community. So introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Kristen. Um, I am, um, I guess I'll give this spiel from my TikTok video. Um, I am a military wife, sister, daughter, niece, cousin, granddaughter, great granddaughter, great niece, so on and so forth, friend, neighbor. Um, my family has been in America for around four centuries and has participated in um, every armed conflict since we arrived here on good and bad <laughs> historical implications. Okay. My family, you know, fought in the revolution, fought in the civil war, fought in World War One, World War Two, um, going, you know, all the way up to the current day. Um, you know, my husband is a retired combat veteran, um, as is my mother. My brother is a combat veteran. Um, the military world is the only world that I have ever known. I myself have never worn the uniform, but I always joke um, until recently, I had never gone a day of my life without at least one set in the wash. <laughs> and I'm sure you'd look fabulous in fatigues. <laughs> well, you never know. I never wore them, so I just wore them, but I, you know, it's the, it's the world that, that I've known since um, I became a military spouse prior to 9-11, um, since, you know, my mother was an army reservist and was always going on annual, annual training and doing her drill weekends. So I always say uh, it was a lot more than just one weekend a month and two weeks a year. Um, but I, you know, it, it's, it's my family, my camouflage family. So I have been a very strong defender and advocate for our military, for our veterans and their families for many years. Um, even going back to 2014, when I volunteered to serve on the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission under President Obama, which is the mick or mick, um, as we called it, was basically trying to update the military's compensation and benefits, um, as well as for our veterans and their families, because it hadn't been done since Truman. And I just feel like our service members are very often ignored by the wider American population or overlooked. You know, people thank them on July 4th or on Veterans Day or on Memorial Day. But for most people, those days are, you know, there's a sale, a parade, and a barbecue. Whereas for us, you know, it's something that we, you know, we live with every day. Right. And based on that, what was your point on our, the lovely TikTok, which gets to why you and I are on the same camp? So, so my my point is, when it comes to Donald Trump and all of the things that he has done regarding our service members, regarding our veterans, you know, whether that is negatively impacting the benefits that are provided through the VA to our veterans and um, not providing a lot of help to them, or whether it's just his own actions and statements in the public eye, um, you know, Donald Trump and those who support him, whether they be, you know, they consider themselves conservatives, Republican, MAGA, whatever label they give themselves, Donald Trump supporters are now, you know, the, as the president of the Heritage Foundation said, um, we're in an, another American revolution. And when they, you know, when the statement was, it'll be bloodless if the left allows it to be, well, that means that if you don't fight back, no bloodshed will happen. And I'm sorry, but when you have someone who, in my opinion, is essentially a traitor, like Donald Trump is, you know, um, I just, I find that the idea that that man would be the leader 
again that that man would would be the one leading some sort of revolution to benefit only the people that he likes, the people he considers loyal. It's atrocious. And Donald Trump has a very wide uh, reputation for not supporting our service members, regardless of you know what his supporters want to say, his own statements, his own activity. They're just, he does not support our military. He does not support our veterans. And in fact, he looks at them with derision. Yes, as we've seen on many occasions, the way he talked about John McCain and like the suckers and losers. It's it's almost like the fact that we even have to even keep saying this and we have to remind people that are not of sound mind and body that he is a danger not only to this country in terms of our freedoms, but the way he's proven to not really be an advocate for the military outside of just his jargon that he makes it sound like he cares. It's it's just astonishing that we just are still in this place where so many Americans have been kind of uh, Stockholm syndromed into this place of, you know, it's like I've been saying that we need like, Abe's lobotomy farms for the whole lot of them, you know, just like line them up and get them. It's like after post War II, after Germany in World War II, when America was there occupied, you know, the German people who had proven to be not much distant than what MAGA is about to kind of experience, should they get that opportunity, you know, they were given like simple jobs, like farm jobs, you know, like all the kind of heavy you know, militarized kind of business was kind of squelched because they wanted them to kind of become more simple again because the the anger and the rage that comes with war and with that whole mindset from, I mean, I just have to say this, I've said it the other day, but I'm going to say it again to you, is that that guy from uh, the Heritage Foundation, whatever his name is, um, I think he's trying to scare the electorate because they really do know they're going to lose. Whether it's Joe or Joe in a casket or, or whoever is going to be the, the Democratic ticket in November, I feel like they're trying to scare people into voting for Trump. And I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to work in the opposite. And that's why they're trying well, to ratchet up this whole I think, you know, he has no skin in the game. He's not sent, He's not going to fight himself. He's not going to send his children. Donald Trump isn't going to fight himself. He's not going to send his children. Like the people who make these type of statements, they have no one that they love that they're going to be sending onto a battlefield. They know that that they're protected by their privilege. And it's, it's appalling to me because... When, you know, when you look at who our military is today, like the average age of a service member is, you know, in their mid to late 20s. That's Gen Z and millennials, two of the most left-leaning generations in this nation's history. And and I'm not, like, I'm not somebody who just said, oh, you know, I'm going off of what was shown on the news. Like, I read Project 2025. I read Chapter 4, which is the Department of Defense chapter. I know what it says. You know, just like I know how Trump has talked about our military. and. I know how, you know, those who have served in the military who were close around him have tried to raise the alarm. I mean, when you have his defense secretary, General Mattis, saying that, you know, Trump is a threat to our democracy, that is something we need to listen to. When you have Trump calling General Kelly a liar, General Kelly, who is his Homeland Security secretary, and then the chief of staff, General Kelly, who himself is a gold star father. General Kelly is only one of three sources that is reported to, you know, that reported the suckers and losers comments, you know, that reported that Trump didn't want to get his hair wet going to a military cemetery in France, that that Trump didn't think that the people who, you know, the 1800 Marines who died on a nearby battlefield, that that, that was a worthy sacrifice. He looks down on them. And for myself, I just, I'm appalled. You know, Donald Trump, even recently in just this year, has said negative things about Gold Star families. 
you know, and, but he has a history of that, even going back before he was elected, like the Khan family, you know, he was very Islamophobic and he mocked them because, you know, a gold star mother was so upset she couldn't bring herself to talk about the loss of her son. And he mocked them for that, yeah. saying that she wasn't even allowed to speak. Like, it, it's just things like that, you know, and then like with Donald Trump calling, um, calling Le David Johnson's widow, you know, and telling her that her husband knew what he signed up for. Donald Trump couldn't even be bothered to go to Delaware, to go to Dover Air Force Base, to meet the angel flight that was bringing those caskets home from Africa, wrapped in flags. And one of those was Le David Johnson, but he could tell his widow, your husband knew what he signed up for. Like she, she has said that that was so much worse. And I mean, we're talking about a man who he didn't want to take pictures with our wounded because he didn't want, he didn't like the optics. Yeah. He didn't want to sign letters of condolence, you know, to the families of the fallen because he didn't want to, he didn't want that to be associated with him. Like, it's just to, to me, I look at him and I think that is not someone that we should entrust the well being of our service members to when he doesn't believe that their sacrifice is something of value to such an extent that this is someone who called for the public execution of the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Like he, he said that about General Milley just after he left office or after he retired. Like uh, to me, I just think about it and I'm like, I'm supposed to trust you with the people that I love, my right. neighbors, my friends, my, my extended family, my, you know, cause in the military, your friends become your family cause you're far from home. So, right. you know, you meet somebody at one base and you love them like a sibling, you know, they become your family. I just, I don't trust him with their lives. Right. Well, you said you've used a word that I find really important to this next election twice in this last, in this last bit. And that's the word love. And you said that he, you know, the the Trump and that guy from the Heritage Foundation, people they love are not going to be on the front lines. You have to love yourself enough to get into the voting booth and not vote for him. Like people who vote for him have no self-love. I am, there's something so hateful about him proven in the courts of law. There's no secret. He is a pathological lying criminal. And if you can go into the booth and vote for him, there's something deviant about you. You who could say that regardless of that, I'm voting for him. You can't, it's not regardless nothing. If you can look in the mirror and say, I am voting for a psychotic criminal liar, then you have, there's something wrong with you, something deeply, deeply disturbing. Either you're living vicariously through that kind of psychosis and wish you had that kind, it's like, it's really crazy. But I think the word love is really important to protecting the ones we love, voting for yourself if you love yourself. I think love is, an, I think love is gonna be on the ballot this season, I really do. I know it sounds funny, but I live in Los Angeles, so it's hard. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, I think I think when the hardest part about patriotism, um, in my opinion, is when you love your country, it isn't it isn't some it, it isn't something that is intangible always. You know, it, it's about what you you do you know, for your country, for the people around you, for your fellow Americans. And the problem with Donald Trump is I just, I don't think he loves anyone except himself. And I don't believe that he loves the American people because he doesn't talk about them like he loves them. He doesn't talk about the American people as if he believes that we're better together. It's, it's that very arrogant and privileged way of looking at our nation that it's here to serve him. We're here to give to him. You know, our loyalty is owed to him and it doesn't go the other way. I don't think he loves himself. I think he's obsessed with himself. And I think there's a big difference between love and obsession. And yeah. I and it's almost like I wouldn't even give him the compliments. 
that he would have the capacity to love himself. Because if you love yourself, the first thing you do is you want to help your fellow man. You know what I mean? He's, and he's, what is he? Helping people with money? He's, you know, and lying about that he wants to help Black people. And no, he's, it, the word love in him doesn't compute to me. Well, and I mean, he doesn't, like, the things that he values are, you know, he values admiration. And he values those who never question him, that absolutism. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but, you know, we just don't live in that world. And, you know, the way that he is willing to abandon, like, our allies, for instance, you know, when he said that, um, I believe Khan Magazine quoted him as saying that he would let Russia do whatever the hell they want to NATO. Those are our allies. We have hundreds of thousands of service members in Europe. We have countless Americans who live in Europe. And he's talking about just sacrificing that. Like, you know, no one is intimidated by Croatia, but they're intimidated by America. So if America stands behind Croatia, that's how NATO survives because every part of NATO is like that. No, individually, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. But together, we are a force to be reckoned with. That's the entire point. And to sacrifice that to Russia, who after World War II, Russia never retreated. They took all of those countries for themselves. And that's how they created the Soviet Union. Right. And they never, they didn't get them, they didn't give them back until the Soviet Union crumbled. Right. And so, it, what was that, 91? So it's just like, for me, I'm looking at this going, these are, these are hundreds of millions of people that are depending on the United States for collective security to push back against Russia when Russia is already showing aggression in other parts of Europe. Like they're not talking, you know, like we have, we have people who go to, you know, Eastern Europe to go to, to Romania and Poland and all those places. And they provide, um, you know, their ad, their advisors and they help train. And, and you know what, when they're there, like they're teaching people how to defend their homes because those people are genuinely afraid that Russia is going to come across their borders. Yeah, it's, and I, I don't. Yeah, Trump is not interested in America being a superpower. He's no, he's not. America just being like only about America, which is not superpower. Because cut to we, you know, if left to our own devices, I don't think we're all that in a bag of chips. You know. But see, I don't think that's really true, though, because. Like in 2018, Donald Trump sent, you know, his daughter as as a member of his companies to go get trademarks from China. You know, Donald Trump had, for many decades relied on Deutsche Bank out of Germany. You know, like he himself deals internationally business wise to be profitable. So when you're talking about isolating America, America first, well, that's not even how Donald Trump has practiced his own life. He has, has counted on the world stage, you know, in order to have financial success. And so America just, we cannot live alone. There's only one nation that has truly pulled back from other nations, and that's North Korea. We don't want that. But that America first thing is more of a soundbite to get the kooky, you know, it's, it's what helped him get those people, you know, addicted to him thinking that they are going to be America first. It's the same America first crowd from the 30s that were on the precipice of being Nazis here in America. Like, yeah, something it was to about, a piece about sound that he, he know, look, he's smarter than all of us in terms of marketing. We can give him that. So if he's saying America first, it's not because he met more. It's not like he's going to stop taking money from foreign banks for his business. He just wants to galvanize those lunatics, which he's been able to get way too many of them willing to vote for him. But without trying to read tea leaves and whatever, obviously you're hell bent like me on voting for a Democrat no matter what in the November yep. election. Um, and I think we always. I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, and I, I think. Trump's followers who, you know, whether they talk about a civil war, which has been what they've talked about, you know, for the last couple of years, now it's revolution, whatever, like the moment that you consider the United States 
and your fellow Americans to be your enemy and you become an enemy combatant because of your own choices, like the military's oath is against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So the idea that you with your AR-15 or however many, you know, Glock you own or whatever, that you're somehow going to overcome a, a modern day military, like with tanks and drones and ICBMs and, you know, satellite visionary uh, you know, or satellites from above that can see with their optics down to the grains of sand. Like this technology that our military uses, um, have you seen the the stand-up comedian who does the the um he does a bit about the the NRA versus the military? No, 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 but I'm sure oh, it's, it's, it's funny. It's funny because essentially it's like all these NRA guys with their AR 15s and everything, and it's like one military guy in a bunker who just presses a button. Like that's that's not unrealistic. And I just don't think that. I don't think that these MAGA genuinely want to go up against their military. I genuinely think that the military will just betray their oath, abandon the nation, and suddenly turn traitor. Well, and but based on that, there we see that and the conversation that a lot of military a lot of military people do support him. Do you know actively that that's just like a fringe group of them? I mean, is so? I mean, we can look at the most recent voting record. You know, when it came to the most recent presidential election, the majority of the military voted for President Biden. They did not vote for Donald Trump. And so, you know, when you look at that and you're able to see like, OK, like this is younger people who voted for Biden, not for Trump. Well, the military hasn't gotten more conservative in the in the years since. Like, let's just be realistic. President Biden got the PACT Act. There's what, seven million veterans in the United States, the PACT Act, which expanded VA benefits to cover exposure to toxic substances like burn pits, there's over a million claims that have been granted out of 7 million total veterans. That is a tremendous boost for our veterans. When you talk about this last year in January, our military received a pay, a pay raise above 5%. That's the largest pay raise in 22 years. The last time we had a pay raise greater than that was the year after 9-11. Wow. Like it's, you know, so President Biden, he's done things to help our service members, to help our veterans and to help their families. What has Trump done besides say that he doesn't like people who are captured and, you know, you're a loser if you fall on the battlefield and you're a sucker if you serve in uniform. And if you're an officer who stands against him, then you should be publicly executed. I mean, there's right. a reason why. Who had I was just going to say, there's a reason why in Project 2025, it says that the 06s through 09s, which are the higher ranks of officers, it says that they don't have warfare experience. Like, we just spent 20 years at war. <laughs> These guys have been in the military for like 20, 30 years. War is the majority of their career, but they don't even value them because they just, you know, that, they, that, they just don't. That's something that in chapter four of the 20. Yeah, of project 2025. Are there any other highlights that you can share with us from the. Um, yeah, they, uh, the they want, uh, mil they want military recruiters at um, political events. Uh, they want military recruiters at political events and they want every single American teenager to take the ASVAB, which is the military aptitude test. They must be requ be required to take it. Um, for me, when I read it, it seems like there's something that is not said, like some standard that the military is supposed to meet, but it doesn't really like it. You got to read between the lines. Beyond that, there's a lot of derision for um, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, they call out like the LGBTQI plus uh, specifically. Um, and you can I mean, you can essentially understand and you can infer that if you read that section of Project 2025, that they want the military to be made up of white men. Right. I'm sure and they, they want to purge the ranks and the leadership of those who aren't loyal. They'd love to go back to don't ask, don't <laughs> Oh, I forgot one thing. Um, they want to expand our nuclear arsenal. That's in there. 
Yeah, they're nuts, man. Where there's no news, there's no news there. We know that they're <laughs> evil. You know what I mean? It's almost like, but I want, but this is an important conversation because it's very centered on the military, and you speaking from the heart of it means that between now and November, we need to all have conversations with people who really understand what is at what is at stake how it infects personally the lives of the military. I mean, and, you know, and gays and whatever, but not enough is focused on the military. And that's, you know, and and it's good that I you even told me about that a million claims have been made because of the burn pits, because of the, um, yeah. The, what, the PACT Act, yeah. I'm old, I'm allowed to forget. That's that. okay. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'm you know I just want to say I'm so glad that the social media exists because it a brought me to you, but it also brought me to this community that I feel um, a responsibility to kind of make sure that we keep like America America again. I actually want to do instead of MAGA, I want to do make Trump lose again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a t-shirt, that's going to be, I'm going to put that on my merch store. But um, I mean, you know, I think, I think like when it comes to our service members and when it, you know, a lot of people think when they leave the military, whether they separate or, you know, they are separated or they retire, that suddenly, you know, it's done for them. But our veterans, our retirees, you know, are wounded. Like for them, they don't, the overwhelming majority in, in my experience feel like that oath is forever. You know, and that's why so many after they retire, they go work in the defense industry. You know, they they served in uniform all those years. And then as a civilian, they go work for the companies that work for our military. Right. You know, and it's just like and you can have an opinion about the military industrial complex. And I think there's conversations to have. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just think like the for the rank and file, the majority of those people are also veterans. And right. so it's like. You know, you when when I see people who talk about the way that, you know, some of these Trump supporters and the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society and and their ilk, when they talk, it's like they want it's like they want to eliminate my loved ones who are the ones who have been defending this country, are the ones who've been sacrificing. Because I mean, the number of times that my children did not have their father there because he was serving. He was, whether he was downrange, overseas, on a mission, on duty, training, whatever, you know, like my children sacrificed many moments for this country when they were so little, they didn't even recognize that's what they were doing. And I'm not unique. My family's history of service is not even unique. I, I'm not necessarily special. I'm just loud. Well, that's good, but you know, I I actually think there's a there's a there's a difference between the military and the people that actively go to war and the military complex. I I'm thinking of it. These are the people that are doing the work, and then there's the ones that are just sc scamming the billions of dollars from the government to create you know this kind of smoke and mirrors that that Pentagon is really doing. I don't know. I just think it. I think I think there's two levels to that, and I think yeah, I think it's a conversation worth having to see. Yeah. When, I mean, you can't look at a budget approaching a trillion dollars and not say, hmm. And you know, you can't look at the pushback when we try to help our veterans and not say, hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like you you can't. You know, and a the million. nice thing about America is we have the free speech to question. We have the free speech to say. We want to know, and we have the freedom of the press to say we want to investigate. And you know, I think that that's something we will lose under Trump. The hypocrisy that the veterans are not treated like royalty when you know that there's a nine hundred billion dollar budget. It's almost yeah. like, how do you square that? Like that's the that's the part of our entire government that's corrupt. That is why I would, could never be a politician. Because I would just not be able to just swallow the bullshit that you have to. And I mean, yeah, there's a few good ones, but I could count them on like maybe, maybe, not even definitely. I just think that for the most part, 
the people who are in the trenches are the ones that need to be treated like gold and not the not the the highfalutin you know three piece suits horrible you know well i think it's i think it's important that most people <laughs> yeah i think it's important for for most people to understand a basic truth and that is civilians start wars because the war fighters are the peace bringers they don't want to fight they they want to train so that they never have to use their training. They want to plan so that they never have to implement the plan because it's them. It's the people they care about. It's their colleagues, their friends, their buddies. You know, it, it's their families. It's their children. It's, you know, the people that they love, the people they care about, you know, and they don't, people don't join the military just for its tradition. They join the military because of what it means to them and for their own personal reasons. But the military does not declare war. The military does not choose to go to war. That choice is made by civilians in government. And, and that's, a, that's a long tradition, you know? And I just, I think that people have this kind of romanticized vision of what war is, when in reality it is ugly and it is very hard and it is heartbreaking. And no one wins. It's yeah. just who who loses the least. Loss after loss after loss. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you know what? If you've, until, until you have looked, like I have, at a little boy running around playing with his toys, knowing that he never met his father because a sniper took out his father on the day that little boy was born. Yeah. Until you look at him, you have no idea what that's like. Until you hold a gold star mother and have her cry and you cry in return because her son died so that my mother could come home. Like you have no idea. There is a tremendous amount of heartbreak involved in war, even for the victors, even for the victors. Yeah. And I, I just feel like those who talk about revolution, they don't intend on doing any fighting. Or they think it's like Call of Duty and they can go home at the end of the day and go pick up a, a Mountain Dew on the drive. And that's well, not it's also careful what you wish for. They're calling in such karma boomerang. That's why I am convinced that they're just trying to scare the electorate into thinking Trump is the answer. Unfortunately, a lot of it seems to be working, but I think that we have a, we have a hill to climb and I think that the reason why this country exists is because we're familiar with climbing hills to get things done. And I'm all ready for it. I mean, as someone who spent their whole life trying to claw their way out of whatever kind of horrible situation I'd even found myself in or put myself in, I mean, which is the nature of my personal journey and my story, which is almost like I liken it to you know, the Jews who built the pyramid, pushing those heavy stones uphill. I mean, that's that's kind of my plight in life, too. It's never, I never get to the top and been like, ah. So I don't know what that's like, but I think that that's part of like creating a country that is that's based on freedom and our freedoms being stripped away is just like, wait a minute. Don't well, and our freedoms and then declare a revolution you've already started yeah. you've started the you've started the fucking war mary you know what i mean like that guy is it's so inappropriate to say that about starting a bloodless revolution you know what i mean where i don't think a bloodless revolution ever happened the fact that he even thinks that it's a, that it's a possibility is weird well, and I think I mean, there's two, there's a, a couple of things when it, when it comes to that, um, because first of all, I wish that people would stop like with this whole, like, oh, we're going to send SEAL Team 6. Like our military is not supposed to be used like that. <laughs> you know, like, please don't, like when you, when people say that and they normalize that idea that our military suddenly is going to come, become assassins, like that's, the, it, I find it incredibly um, just problematic, offensive, uh, heartbreaking, 
but but beyond that, I think Americans need to wake up to a very, very sad reality, and that is no one is coming to save us. There are no, there's no superhero going to swoop in. You know, I joke and call my husband Captain America, but like the Captain America doesn't exist. That That is a fantasy. We have to save ourselves and it starts with our vote. It doesn't end there. It starts there. And I think that we have to use our vote and our voices to say enough. We're not okay with a man who has been accused of molesting children, of peeping on teenage beauty queens, on harassing and assaulting women, on stealing classified materials and keeping them and lying about having them and refusing to give them back (laughs) and, you know, and denigrating our intelligence community and not and, and admiring dictators and authoritarian regimes and joking about wanting to be a dictator himself, but only for one day, of course, I say in all sarcasm, <laughs> like I just, to me, it's like Donald Trump is the very antithesis of, of who we should want to lead us. And even the Republicans, even the conservatives, they are owed better by their own leadership than someone like Donald Trump and like those who would put him into positions of power, like those who would put the Supreme Court justices into positions of power. Those people who are more conservative, they deserve better leaders. We all, as Americans, deserve better opposition than someone who does not value the average American or the United States as a whole. Right. <laughs> you tell me I'm not thrilled I met you. <laughs> See, well, I'm that- thrilled to meet you too, okay? Or no. Abe. I'm thrilled. I mean, that I've not had this kind of conversation with someone who speaks from the heart and soul of the military. And I think it's a really important conversation. And I think we should connect again before the election because it'll be interesting to see how this whole process unfolds. Um, I don't want to get into the tea leaf reading business, like even though (laughs) <laughs> I have a couple times, but um, I, I just feel like no matter what, we cannot vote for a lying sack of shit. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I, it's funny because like, I, I consider myself to be a person of faith. And so when I use my faith as the standard to which I judge people, like Donald Trump has, he is the antithesis of that. He doesn't apply the tenets of anything. He does not walk with God, wh- whatever God you believe in. Like he, he doesn't, he, he actually just, he seems to use it like it's a shit. Excuse yeah? me, a man who has broken all 10 of the commandments cannot support the idea of having the 10 commandments in classrooms. Yeah, I mean- exactly. <laughs> The other thing that I've been saying a lot, because it helps me rather than just staying in this place of like, oh my God, freaking out, is that it's all embarrassing. Like when you look at something and someone is embarrassing, that kind of makes, gives you a better perspective. It's, It's almost like it clears the air for you to see just the level of like horrendous, it's, he's embarrassing. Like I keep going to these people that I know that are voting for him smart people i'm like well then there's a there's something missing in your soul there's something missing in your soul it's well i mean i think when we have like i i I love to read so i i look at books written by people who worked with trump you know and when they have tried to raise the alarm like um there's a a book by the former cia director john brennan um his book is called undaunted and like he talks about interacting with Trump. You know, he he's very critical of Donald Trump and his treatment of the intelligence community. And then you have like Malcolm Nance who published They Want to Kill Americans. You know, the the front cover of the book is the gallows that Trump's mob erected to hang Mike Pence, the vice president. Like I just I feel like when when those who are in the upper echelons of power and have that direct experience with Donald Trump say this this man is dangerous to our freedoms, to 
to just our rights and our constitution and everything our country stands for. Like, I think that we need to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I am clear that your perspective is an important voice into this election. And I know that you're going to be engaged in making sure we just keep your family that you come from safe from the worst case scenario. We have to do our best. If there's a fight up ahead, and yes, the vote is our armor when or, or our weapon, you know, either the vote is your voice. Yeah, your voice is your vote. That's like, you know, that kind of bumper sticker. But in a case where we've already been threatened with some kind of revolution nonsense, it's nonsense. It's embarrassing nonsense that he can go on public television and speak like that, which yeah. kind of sounds like it's against the law, but what do I know? We have illegal people running around. You know what I mean? But but the but the fact that our vote is the first and only thing between you and the end of democracy is like these people who are threatening not to vote because of a war that's going on in a country far, far away. Like that's unacceptable. That's inexcusable. That is that is anti-American. That is that is not loving yourself. Those people don't love themselves because if you love yourself, if you're a woman and you're like not going to vote and you're of age to be essayed and would need an abortion and you're not in any financial situation to get out of the state, to get, like if you're not voting for the one person that's got your back and your front, but then your back, you know what I mean? <laughs> I had to throw. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't understand that. Those people are un-American. Like I feel I like to vote ever, you know. I think with when you when you don't want to participate in an effective way in our democracy, which I do not believe that casting a vote for a third party candidate is effective. I I I, I just don't see it as effective. I understand taking an ideological stance, but the situation we are in now is too precarious and this is too important precarious um, so from dire is a better word yeah it, absolutely but to me i think to not use your your vote to try and save this constitutional republic of our democracy is to silence yourself and accept the fate on behalf of everyone around you and Which we are seeing America. every day what is the title of my life story won't be silent. That's yes. in my post. That's the documentary that's coming out. It's my book. It's it's what we all have to live by. And and when we start scapegoating people in the United States, you know, when we start saying that it's women, it's the disabled, it's the sick, it's the poor, it's the LGBTQI plus people, it's you know criminals, it's black people, it's brown people, it's immigrants, it's people who are Muslim or people who are Jewish or people who are atheist or when you start scapegoating all these different groups of people and then you start talking about internment camps and forced deportations, there is a very, very dangerous precedent for that. And it and it precedes even, even the 1900s. It goes back many, many centuries in the past and it has never worked out well for everyday average people. It has always been the people who suffer, not the leaders, the people. Yes, but just on, unrelated to the military, but very about America. The people burning the American flag, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. I don't I think, think the free right for, I think the First Amendment needs an amendment. I don't think, I don't think, just, I just think that it's too weird to do. You know what it's, I mean? It's kind of, it's funny. I asked my husband about, about it one time and and he told me that um, essentially he has sacrificed for to protect their right to burn the flag that he has dedicated his life to protect. And he said, he'll do it again. So it was just, you know, and he doesn't agree with it, but he says, you know, 
if you if you make that something that people cannot do to show their extreme displeasure, then you know it's just it's one domino that falls, and you know it's just I yeah, don't agree with I don't agree with it, and for myself, I find it I I find it scary. it's not it's not that it's cringe. It's one of those things like. Uh, that's the flag that's on the uniform that my husband wore, that my brother wore, that my mother wore, that my aunt wore, that you know my cousins wore, that my my grandfather and my and or all, multiple grandfathers actually, and you know my great grandfather and my great uncles and so on. And so, I mean, that's the flag that that was on their uniforms, you know. And I think like, it's spirited, and there should be, and it should not be okay. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a big flag waver anyway, gay or otherwise. I think, you know, I, either of them <laughs> with anything I wear. <laughs> but I just kind of feel like there, there's like a mean spiritedness. You know, it's like we're never, you know, look, we're never going to make everybody happy. And we're never going to please the masses, really. But at least show a little bit of, you know, because it's not only just about that, you know, it's when you think about like the Super Bowl, it, that's also, there's just certain moments where the American flag kind of means something, you know what I mean? And yeah. and just to burn it to whatever, like I'd rather see it upside down, like at Alito's house, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we have in three weeks, three weeks from today, that American flag is going to represent us to the entire world in Paris. We start the Olympics in three weeks. And so I think to the entire world, if they see Americans willing to burn our flag, I think to them, it is a symbol that America as a nation is on fire. And I just, I feel like, I feel like right now is the worst possible time for people to do things like that. And for me, I want to reclaim the flag from you know, the MAGA, and I want to reclaim the word patriot for those who are so unpatriotic. You know, I I want America to stand for all 340 million of us, not just who live in the U.S., but who are all across the world. But, you know, nationality wise, we're Americans, you know, and I, I feel like we need to take back what MAGA has tried to steal from all of us, which right. is the idea that to love this country means that you have to be an extremist wanting to destroy it. It makes no sense. It's embarrassing. It brings me yeah. back to embarrassing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. when you're being like, it's like, it, it not is it a, di would a dichotomy work? It's almost like it's an oxymoron. Yeah. It just does not compute. It's just... It, it yeah, it just it's embarrassing, and and I don't I don't want to, you know, end our. Well, I mean, embarrassing. I but. I will say you know I've like I said I, I've never worn the uniform, but I feel like if you know I have a platform and I have a voice and I'm informed and I grow more informed every day and my perspective evolves every single day, and if the thing that I'm known for is standing up for our military and our veterans and their families. I'm okay with that. You know, even though I even though I haven't worn the uniform, I can at least say I'm with you and I support you and I will defend you while you defend all of us. Darling, I would vote for you over Trump for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no way. I like my privacy. <laughs> you know, and politicians are annoying, you know. What I mean? You know, but at the same time like you know, my my husband retired last year from active duty, and yet he's still he's still you know in in some ways is serving, and like I'm it, he still goes overseas with our military. He still you know is involved with our service members every single day. Him and a bunch of other veterans every single day, you know. And when it comes to election time, like he'll have just gotten home when it, when election day comes, and so I'm just like I think about. Even though he's done, we're still sacrificing for the country. We're still, we're still taking time, up, you know, time apart for the for the little moments. You know, he's gonna miss bedtime stories and you know starting school, and he's gonna miss dance recitals and soccer games, and you know he he's still gonna miss all that stuff. And 
every single military member and every single veteran who dedicates their life to America, they deserve better than Donald Trump. And they deserve better than anyone who wants Donald Trump in a position of power or someone like him. Right. Yeah. You're right. Look, I'm, again, had I not just zipped into Twitter, we might not have had this very important conversation, which we will have again, because this is one of the, we have to pick like three or four really important conversations in general to get the voting pool out there to kind of motivate like women, the military families that if 7 million people are affected from burn pits, if, like if they all Well, vote, 7 million, it's 7 million veterans. That's how many we have. 7 million veterans in the US, um, but a million claims were granted for burn pits. And that was just, I think that, I think that was the number they released in May. So right. like that's one out of seven. That's one out of every, that's one out of seven. That is a huge percentage of our veterans who underneath Donald Trump, he he didn't help them. Biden helped, but Trump didn't. Right. But Biden, Biden didn't cut benefits and disability and housing and stipends and, you know, any other benefits for our veterans. Trump did, but Biden expanded those things. Biden got them a bigger raise than they've had. Our, Biden, both our military and our veterans. It goes and that's back, the thing. It goes back to the word love. He had his son who was in the military, um, who he loved, and sees the repercussions of how that affects family, tragically. And of course, yeah. he played a, played a role in helping. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's just it, a no brainer. And the fact that people with no brains, so many of them exist in this country that are going to blindly vote for that lying criminal. <laughs> I can't. I, lying criminal. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, he a criminal who cannot even enter like countries that we are allied with because of his convictions. Well, I'm he sure. He can't even go there. And yeah. they would have to change their own laws to allow him to come for a diplomatic visit. Like it's they would have to change their own laws. That's crazy. And you know, like I tell you what, when we think about the president, okay, we he's the commander in chief. They they are the commander in chief. But beyond that, they're a leader. After we lost 13 people pulling out of Afghanistan, President Biden gave a national address and took responsibility for the horrible way that that went, that the withdrawal went. Donald Trump has never taken responsibility for, excuse my language, for a goddamn thing in his entire life. It's yeah. always someone else's fault. And, and that's, uh, even look at how he was for January 6th. He blamed the mayor of DC and the speaker of the house for not letting the president of the United States of America bring in troops, which is, which when you find out who actually would have made that decision, it would have been the acting defense secretary, a man by the name of Chris Miller, who, by the way, wrote the Department of Defense chapter of Project 2025. Yikes. Yeah. Look, you're preaching to the choir, honey. Everyone. That, <laughs> everyone. I, know, that, I feel like I could just talk about this forever. <laughs> no, no, no. Clearly, you need like a whole weekend chat with you for sure. But um, <laughs> look, again, it's an important conversation to keep having. Keep speaking out. I'm, I'm again, thrilled to have met you. And uh, and you're as lovely as you are in your videos. I'm so happy to know that like in a conversation that it's not like sometimes with when you, there's people that you see on TikTok, like who they actually are and how they actually talk and all that, you realize like, oh, that's not how they, they really interact with other people. But I'm, I'm so pleasantly just satisfied to know that your content is you. It, it's not like a yeah, character, no, no, it's you. There's no fake nothing. I mean, I, I think my content is me. I do play a character sometimes when I do okay. like sarcasm and satire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we, we just be who we be, you know? I just, I've made it my life mes message to just be on brutally honest Abe. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah that's what it is. But um, 
I'm going to send you an email when we're okay. done. I just want it uh, for, for doing this with me. Absolutely. I'm going to send you my book. Well, thank you. I will read it. I am an avid reader. <laughs> I, I mentioned two just in this conversation. I noted. Anyway, <laughs> have a great weekend. Pleasure. You too. Online, and uh, we'll stay in touch for sure. Absolutely. Have a wonderful weekend, Abe. Bye. Bye.